Ace Podcast. Hello again, and welcome to another episode of Vaguely Accurate, the show where we're giving student research the media attention it deserves. Today, I'd like to welcome Chloe Boot, a molecular coral biologist who is currently moving over to Australia to do a PhD. She's extremely excited, and the enthusiasm she has shown for her field throughout this interview is fantastic. So without holding you up any further, you, for the rest of the episode, you'll be hearing my interview with Chloe. Thank you. Um, hi, yes, I'm Chloe, um, and yeah, I'm originally from the UK. I studied my undergrad at the University of Portsmouth, doing marine biology, and then I specialised for my master's at the University of Essex, studying tropical marine biology, and, um, and now I'm off to James Cook University to do my PhD, and I specialise, I suppose, in coral molecular biology. So what got you interested in marine biology to start off with? Um, I think a lot of, a few things, like being a small child, living in England, going to Devon and Cornwall and having to do rock falling and things like this. Um, and Far from tropical waters. I know, right? <laughs> and then I suppose a lot of it came um, David Attenborough as a child, watching him on TV and stuff like that. I was obsessed with the natural world. And I think mainly I was just at a young age, I decided that I wanted to be a sea doctor because I felt human doctors made the humans better, so surely a sea doctor will make the sea better. And then my parents thought this was so adorable and they encouraged it. And now I suppose that's why I'm here because I just want to make the sea better. Awesome. Idealistic dream, probably <laughs> screwed. Hey, but... you've stuck with it. <laughs> Couldn't imagine doing anything else. <laughs> awesome. So um, I suppose the next logical question is why coral? Like there's a lot going on with the ocean oh from everything from pH to circulations and currents. Oxygen uh, running out Oxygen now. running out. So bad. So, so why, why corals itself? Um, I think I've always had a weird fascination with inverts, like sea anemones and starfish and corals. I just think they're adorable, which is just strange. <laughs> I know. People don't normally look at coral and be like, oh, you're so cute. But I do. Possibly the symmetry. Yeah, I don't know. There's something there. And, um, and I just like that the fact they're really basic, essentially quite basic organisms, but they do so much for our world. And I felt when, when I was at an age of thinking about specialising and what I really wanted to study... And as I said, being a nerd from an early age, that was probably when I was about 15. At the time, I was like, what's really being impacted? And there was a lot of stuff already apparent that was, like, detrimental to reefs. And I suppose I just got obsessed with the idea of one way I could make the sea better, I suppose, is help coral reefs because they do so much for our world. And then... And I think studying geology at A-level, I did um, a bit on coral reefs then as well, and that's what got me hooked. So what exactly do they do? You've said several times they do so much. What do they do for us? Everything. Um, so I suppose I get this quite a bit in when I'm back home in England, especially trying to convince people in England to be more environmentally friendly to help reefs, and they're like, why? It doesn't affect me. I live in England. I'm like, wow, small-minded. Um, <laughs> but um, essentially, I mean, reefs support about 90% of our marine organisms. So without them, we lose a load of our wildlife and our biodiversity um and then and that's the main thing for me i feel that personally um an ecosystem and a species shouldn't have to have a price to exist like we're destroying something that's our fault that's what we're doing and that shouldn't have to have a a need or something it shouldn't have to do something to therefore be worthwhile surviving but for the people who don't really care about animals and are more into like the economic benefits i suppose they supply, they do like all our nutrient cycling, um, so like nitrogen, carbon, um, they produce, so about half of our oxygen comes from the ocean and then two thirds of that half comes from reefs. So we need them for oxygen, we need them um, 
And then also there's a lot of potential in marine bio products. So anything that could be used to make drugs and help keep everyone healthy, like anti-asthma and anti-inflammatory rejuvenation stuff with like, you know, echinoids can grow back limbs and um, starfish. Um, and then coastal protection, without them, our islands and stuff are going to washed away. The Maldives are disappearing because they don't have their reefs. Um, the 2008 tsunami, was it four? I can't remember. That would have been a lot less heavily impacted if on the coastal region if they'd still had their reefs and their seagrass and their mangrove beds because these are all natural like buffers against wave energy. They're like worth more economically like by two magnitudes than rainforests. Everyone's like, oh, reefs, you know, uh, rainforests of the sea, but actually it's quite simply the rainforests of the reefs of the land <laughs> because, but... I don't know, I've gone for ages. I think I've covered up most of the main big ones there, but they're just so hugely important to our way of life. And oh, and like a billion people directly depend on them, like <laughs> for like food and sustenance, sustenance. Just that as a cycle. You know, you know, you know, nutrients, food, ecosystem services, land security, health. Oh, and then all the animals are really lovely and amazing and diverse and should like be able to exist without us just poisoning everything. Sorry. I get angry. <laughs> you do. Um, I get passionate about it. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like it's probably worth getting a definition because it's a, um, of what coral is because it's quite misunderstood that a lot of people seem to think they're um, plant life, which mm. is not. That right. is true. I, yeah. So corals are animals. Um, and they are, most of them are colonial animals, so they're lots of little tiny individual polyps, which basically look like tiny little weenie sea anemones, simplified, and they all live together in one big colony, um, and they, obviously there's hermatypic and ahermatypic, hermatypic are the ones that basically build the reefs, they are the architects of the reefs and the ocean, and the amazing thing about corals and why they're so successful is because they have this fantastic symbiosis between um, an animal, a coral animal, and a plant, which is zooxanthellae, which is a dinoflagellate endosymbiont, and it lives within the coral. And together they live off each other's waste products and they grow these amazing structures and support all the life. And the coral with the zooxanthellae, and now also its microbial um, community, living within the coral also is normally defined as the holobiont. But yes, they are animals. They are animals. They're really cute okay. animals. Um, <laughs> what's, what gives them the colour? Are, uh, so, are they all colourful? Um, so the zooxanthellae is what gives them the colour. So the different clades of zooxanthellae are essentially like layman's terms, little subspecies. Mm, but yeah. <laughs> You know, clades, yeah, oh, that'll be up for another interview, I suppose. <laughs> but they give the coral its colour, um, and you see all the different colours because there's different clades. And then, obviously, the big issue and what bleaching is, essentially, that the corals get too stressed and zooxanthellae get too stressed, and they lose their zooxanthellae, and then they lose their colour. And that's when you kind of know that they're on their way out, essentially. Sad. Yes, very sad. It's been quite quite a bit. Not gonna lie. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so you did an honours and a masters. Yeah. The honours itself involving a research project as well. Yeah. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you actually did for your honours before we move on? Um, so my undergrad honours was um, I was out in Indonesia um, with a conservation charity, Operation Wallacea, and I did my undergrad work there where I basically did a project in the field looking at the thermal niche of Parietes lutea. Parietes lutea is quite a sturdy and seen as a more hardier or resilient or resistant to climate change coral species so I wanted to look at what was the real maximum boundary that these this coral could take mm -hmm. because obviously with predicted climate change it's probably a good thing to know like what's the point till they all just die? <laughs> um, so yeah. <laughs> what, did you, what did you find, I suppose? Um, I basically defined, like, the temperature region of what they could still kind of, still just function to, so the level of, like, tolerance, and then their maximum resilient level, so what they could still just about survive under. Hmm. So you could see, you know, what they could really take, essentially. And I can't remember, I can't remember the maximum temperature I actually got them to survive up to, but it was a bit higher than... I originally thought. Okay. 
Sorry, I should probably remember that, but that was like it's always good to three know. three projects ago, four yeah. years ago. I mean, like, you've done a lot since, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I obviously, um, since then, you went on to do a master's of research. Mm-hmm. Um, so what was the focus of that? like? So that was when I started specialising in more molecular stuff because I personally feel that you know, as much as we can make, everyone needs to become more environmentally friendly, like that needs to happen or we're screwed worldwide. But I didn't feel like people would change quick enough, so I felt that molecular and like maybe going to the realms of maybe people would say genetic modification, but you probably get a load of ethics stuff stuck at you then. <laughs> Assisted evolution is kind of the idea that the way that corals can survive. I like that term. Yeah. <laughs> Assisted evolution. Oh well, yeah, that's yeah, that's what it's known as. So like that's where I wanted to get to. So to start on that journey to that, I needed to start doing molecular work and I did molecular at undergrad as one of my units I loved it found it fascinating full nerd and so then yeah so for my masters I was doing a more molecular project looking at um, gene expression under different um, stress could you give us just a brief introduction I suppose and maybe a Mm. conclusion to the methodology and approach you took and maybe what you found so I'd already done temperature stress Um, So now I wanted to look at light intensity because, as we know, light intensity is also increasing. And light intensity with corals can be a good thing up to a point because, obviously, they are technically, the symbodinium is photosynthetic. Mm -hmm. So they love light. But all plants, when you put too much light on them, they get stressed and they will then um, essentially damage themselves. So temperature and light together is an awful combination because it creates the reactive oxygen species within the zooxanthellae, which then it pumps out into the coral, which essentially poisons it and causes bleaching. So yeah, so I wanted to look at what genes were being expressed under light stress, different treatments. So I did like a continuously um, increasing light intensity treatment. I had my control and then I had a fluctuating. So it was like high light one day, high, low light, high light, and so I'm getting higher, but so I'm going back to control on the day off. And then I wanted to look at full transcriptome response but master's budget couldn't do that (laughs) so i picked some genes of interest which relates basically to this process and how it would protect the coral so i looked at ferritin catalase and abc transporters which essentially all play a very important role in keeping either reducing the negative effects of reactive oxygen species or making sure that the coral stoops ticking over nicely essentially while it's stressed so I looked at the gene expression of those under my treatments and looking at the expression levels, it was quite, it was really interesting because normally with fluctuating temperature treatments, the coral is, lives and does better under fluctuating temperature because it has that day to recover. But it seemed in mind with the light, it was more just that the, um, that the fluctuating treatment was kind of, I suppose, confusing it it would start to protect itself it would start to boost its gene expression in the genes that it needed to survive and then it would stop and then it would get stressed again and it was too late essentially because i was looking at acropora which is a more weaker species and unlike parietes it doesn't have energy as much energy stores and it's not as heterotrophic so it depends more on its zooxanthellae but essentially yes i saw that gene expression was higher in the continuously stressed coral rather than the fluctuating. And because of that, looking at the physiological response, I was looking at respiration and other things like photosynthesis, you could see that actually because straight away that the coral produced a load of genes to protect itself because it realised, I'm stressed, I'm going to keep being stressed, save myself, it then did better over the whole treatment than the fluctuating one, which was like, oh, I'm stressed create genes oh no I'm not actually stressed let's not bother oh crap I'm stressed again oh I don't have enough energy to do this because now I'm in trouble and and yeah. basically it wasn't as good um, and it was quite nice how my physiological my genetic results matched up and also I wanted to look at this concept of front loading which is a new thing in um well I've seen in coral papers anyway it was about the idea again that if these corals have like this background expression level of the protective genes already, when they get stressed, it's less energy requirement to make the genes and proteins they need to survive so they can do better. So it's almost like they've got a recipe, I suppose, that they can kind of just go, I know exactly what to do. To yeah, it's more these. like they've already, yeah, they've already got, yeah, yeah, they've already got like a backlog essentially. Like, they've, you know, there's already um, 
something stored away so they can, yeah, kick mm. straight into gear and protect themselves straight away rather than having to start from scratch. And I could see that happening in the heavily stressed coral. That's awesome. What else did I look into on that? So there was a lot. And then Sounds afterwards, yeah, I wanted to look at the proteins as well to back up the genetic response. For those that, um, for those listeners that might not know, could you just give a brief definition of what exactly is gene expression? Basically, gene expression, obviously you have your genes yep. in yourself, in your DNA, and these genes will go under gene expression, which then will produce the proteins that the genes basically um, write for. So these genes all create some kind of product. Yeah. And if you express them more, you will therefore get more of that product. Okay, so it's... and the product is a protein. I'm trying to. So it's almost like it. within your DNA, you've got this. You've got set genes which are, I suppose, recipe cards for proteins. Yes, and like each pro- recipe card thing, yes. I like this I analogy. Like recipes work well. <laughs> and with um, I love baking. <laughs> so you've got these recipe cards mm. for um, each protein, and each protein yeah. is functionally got a different function and is designed for a different purpose yeah it's usually a sole single purpose or do they can they have multiple purposes Ooh. the genes the genes only always code for one protein, protein. but the protein yeah. itself may be a complex protein that can do more than okay. one thing so the best way as we were just saying yeah. you've got your dna which has got your recipes for each protein mm. in there known as genes mm. and under certain conditions whether it be a stressful or relaxed condition the coral itself mm-hmm. will turn on or turn off, pretty much drawing out these recipe cards uh, yeah. and going, up-regulate I want to produce, or down-regulate. Yeah, I yeah. want to produce, so upregulate on this protein because we're, we're under Steam. this condition. Yeah. Um, and downregulate, okay, we're relaxed, we don't need to waste energy producing something we're no longer going to use. Yeah. Is that a nice, easy way? Yeah, that's really good. It? Yeah, I would say that's a nice layman. Yeah, that's good. Okay, awesome. Cool. How would you see these results? You're saying you were watching the gene expression fluctuate like day in day out with the light intensity how are you witnessing this gene expression so the main thing is also i'm obsessed with molecular is the amount of like advancements in technology is mental the stuff you can do now for a much easier price essentially is amazing um so what i was essentially looking at was I would be taking samples of my tissue every four days of my coral tissue because I did a period of stress and a period of recovery and then dunking them in like liquid nitrogen. Later on, I would extract the RNA. So I'd go through a long process of... If you take a sample of tissue, there's a load of ick in there. There's a load of like, you know, epidermal, like dermis cells and all the other stuff that you might get in any kind of biological sample. And you have to clean it down and strip it so you just get down to your basic RNA, which is obviously, and then you can convert it back into where this is gonna get a bit too complicated. Let's just think of that. And then, <laughs> and then you can put it through um, some fancy techniques um, and essentially quantify how much of RNA there is or well, cDNA at that point. That was mainly done with a process called qPCR, which is quantitative polymerase chain reaction. Yep. And I suppose with... Um, I just skipped out a load of steps and a load of stuff. <laughs> and any actual like, biologist is listening to this going like, oh, what? Like, <laughs> so what? <laughs> but yeah, no. <laughs> I very much doubt we have many listeners following mm. you as a, as a recipe again to do this at home. But, oh, God, um, yeah, the chemicals <laughs> and the equipment and like the minus 80 freezer. If you have any of that home, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> I'll do all the science for free. Um, yeah. Cool. So following on from that, um, I suppose you, you've already got to know what each gene does. I mm-hmm. suppose what each gene codes the protein. Has that been produced, I suppose, from previous research already? So you've already got this kind of encyclopedia oh. of each gene? Like, I know there was this project called the Human Genome Project. Yeah. Of, uh, I can't remember the years, but um, fairly recently in regards mm. to genetics, I suppose. Yeah. Where they pretty much produced an encyclopedia of what gene in every in our DNA as humans mm. produced what proteins. So has there been a similar project for coral? Yeah, so everyone is now. There's like the NCBI like database where everyone starts such and other gen banks and stuff like that. People are starting to do full genome sequence, which is essentially the human genome thing, to look at all what all the genes do in the coral and then sort of work it out. Uh, that's why one of the other things I wanted to do an acropora species because it was seems a weaker species and is going to like die off quicker is dying off has died off it's really sad um 
And um, another researcher had recently sequenced the Aquapora genome, uh, Aquapora millipora. I could then look at his, essentially, uh, his encyclopedia and look at his different sequences and pick the ones out that were related to the gene, my genes of interest. Mm -hmm. And then from that, I would run the sequences for a program to basically align all of the potential sequences. So I had like, for ABC Transporter, there was like hundreds. And then you find like an, a similar aligned region throughout the many sequences. And you can chuck in like cousins to the coral. So I was look, also comparing it to other other corals that have been sequenced. And then from there you have this region and then you can put it through another program to essentially design a primer, which is the bit of code that you can use to tag onto your gene of interest. Right. So yeah, it was very lucky. That's, uh, yeah, it was amazing that they'd done that research so I could essentially do mine because <laughs> I, I didn't have yeah, the, uh, the budget or the time to do a full sequence of a fresh coral. Um, with budget and time, um, something I like to ask a lot, um, mm. because it's usually unsaid, what limitations um, or restrictions have you found during I Doing science? Yeah, doing science and your research experience. <laughs> um, I think one of the big things is, obviously, I've done quite a bit of like field work, because obviously being English and into corals doesn't really happen that easily. Um, no, it doesn't. And I think, obviously, field work has this great thing of being looking so glamorous. Oh, I've got a peach, I'm doing science, it's amazing. And yes, that is that aspect, but trying to actually do real science in the field is so is quite stressful and takes a lot of... I suppose resilience in yourself and intuition and being able to roll with the problems. I think I remember my undergrad when I got to Indonesia, I had to like make my own tanks essentially for my corals and make my own flow through system of seawater. And it was a lot easier making the seawater hotter than making it cooler in Indonesia. So like changing ice packs in my seawater tub at like 10 a.m., 4 p.m., uh, 10 and then 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. And like the electricity wasn't grounded. I remember me and my professor, who my infield professor, who was absolutely amazing, absolute freaking genius. Um, he was helping me basically rewire all my electricity plugs because one of them was had a short in it, and basically every time you took stuck your finger in one of my plunge tanks, you'd get a little electric shock <laughs> because none of the electricity is grounded. So you get a lot of issues with field work. We're thinking people don't think about that. That like if you're going to do field work, take duct tape. Seriously, you can use it for anything. And cable ties. And I'm cable ties, that. yes. <laughs> um, you know. Um, and then I suppose also the other limitations of any science is like budget and having the techniques and the resources you need is always hard and it's always something you've got to think into a proposal. I always get annoyed because it's like footballers make millions and then there's like all these amazing research institutes fighting for like grants to try and save the world essentially and I'm just like why our world is so skewed <laughs> so screwed up but yeah so I mean there's quite a few you'll find whenever trying to do research you'll come across new and interesting challenges every step of the way but it's the way you handle those challenges and problems and you fix them and essentially make yourself a better researcher I definitely think I can handle a lot more stress from having the fact that, yeah, going into the field and everything breaking <laughs> or going into like to do your master's research and just everything just like, like on fire. Not literally, I was in a wet lab, but you know what I mean. Which is more impressive if it was so. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> um, so what, you move, You said you're moving on to a PhD now. Mm -hmm. So um, what are you doing it on? Um, so, I mean... This is a proposal I put in, so it might not be exactly what I end up doing. So I've just obviously moved to Australia. I found out I got this PhD a couple of months ago, and I start on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Good luck. Dream PhD, it's so awesome, so excited. But essentially, I suppose I put forward the idea of me and my supervisor, um, I wanted to do full transcriptome analysis. Um, and now I wanted to look at ocean acidification, as I've done temperature, done light. Let's get the uh, last nasty, last, last nasty global issue in, I suppose. Well, there's lots more, but you know, the mega ones. And I wanted to look at, obviously, again, the difference, gene expression under ocean acidification stress. And hopefully with the idea that this can lead on to finding, obviously, you know, the particular important genes that are needed for metabolism and growth and calcification, because the big issue with ocean acidification and 
obviously affecting the pH of the ocean is it's causing it's harder for corals to calcify and grow because they use a stuff called aragonite which essentially is mix which there's becoming less of in the water because there's too much CO2 we'll try and avoid too much chemistry and boring stuff we'll just all fall asleep but essentially they're struggling to grow and then obviously in like a hundred years or so when ocean acidification continues the way it's going water is going to slowly start to become acidic and anything with a calcium skeleton will start to be eroded so I wanted to look at essentially pumping up the CO2 in the seawater and looking at what happens to the corals during that um, I want to look at heliofungia at least maybe I can get another coral in there we'll see because that's the only coral that's like a singular solitary coral rather than a colonial so obviously they fractionate their tissue region so I can see more in depth level what's happening in genetics in within different aspects of the coral itself yep. rather than overall then I suppose again this may not happen we'll see what happens with funding and everything and how much time and maybe this will go into a postdoc but looking at genes that are within it now or may have been like prehistoric ones they don't use anymore or looking at also evolution rates seeing how quickly can this coral evolve to withstand the issues it's facing and then what can we do to make it stronger ever if through that's for acclimatization or acclimation studies or assisted evolution epigenetics or anything and then if that will pass on to the next generation <laughs> that there's a need lot there to explain all those terms would need probably another like 40 minutes uh yeah I'd so like basically to, genetics i'd like to say um thank you very much for coming on the show no and worries. it'll be great to maybe catch up with you in a couple of years if you're yeah once you know definitely what you're going for yes definitely we can have a re, re, re chat and i'll sit down and be like so everything's dead and <laughs> well, so now i'm just a beach hobo because <laughs> there's nothing for me to save and intelligence doesn't get you anywhere <laughs> so, <laughs> a beach hobo with like experience in what was it assisted to, evolution and trying to trying to like save the world and just like failing but yes hopefully hopefully in a couple of years i I'll hope have... your optimistic outlook changes yeah well i'm just i'm a massive idealist i wanted to be a sea doctor since I was six you know massive romantic and just like oh, I'm gonna save the world <laughs> before we go you keep saying you're a bit of an environmentalist and you keep trying to promote your friends and family you know, mm. do more to help so what can we do Ooh, oh god how long have I got um, so many things okay the main things is Everyone can make a difference. Everyone can. That's ridiculous saying, oh, we just have to focus on big companies. But you can be one person attacking a big company and harassing them to be more renewable or sustainable, and that will make a difference. But seriously, guys, you need to recycle. You need to reduce like the use of plastics. My God, they're evil. Um, your carbon emissions. Anything you can do to help reduce that and reuse anything you can. Stop like the whole materialism or something breaks my phone breaks i'll just buy a new one mend it or you know something like that we need to become more sustainable we need to look more into renewables yourselves like i know it's not stupid turn off the lights don't use as much water walk when you can vote for any kind of green or environmentalist party members in your government you know if you know that there's a big company in your town or something like that that's being unenvironmental like report it or go at them or something you know don't just sit around waiting for everyone else to mend it because we're getting to the point that that's not going to happen and everyone needs to start doing it a little bit. Or oh, realistically, if everyone did a lot, my God, we'd maybe not be... So, not try not to swear, swear, screwed. Um, <laughs> but, you know, every little thing can help and will help and also encouraging others to do the same and just become like a full-blown hippie, basically. <laughs> new, new age I always say I'm a new age hippie thank you very much for joining us everyone that was Chloe Boo uh, if you would like to check out our website at vaguelyaccurate.myfreesites.net they're on there you'll also find our Facebook page and if you want to get in touch our email is vaguecomments at gmail.com email us back if you fancy um, sending feedback or even want to just feature yourself or have something to share thank you very much see you next time yeah, bye guys. Thank you for listening. And yeah, seriously, help me save the planet. That would be great. Do it. You can. Be green. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>